Hello, my friends. This is Dr. Deepak Chopra again, and uh, we are continuing our series on uh, conversations and dialogues with luminaries, influencers on the subject of science and spirituality. And as you can see by now, there are so many different diverse uh, views on where science and spirituality make each other complete or how they can be complementary to each other as uh, methods of knowing what we call reality, although I prefer the word existence to reality. Um, but um, today, it's my very special privilege and honor to have as our guest, Donald J. De Gracia. I'm holding his book right now, What is Science? And you can see that he has another book next to him, The Yogic View of Consciousness. So we are going to start our conversation right now by first of all, um, me inviting Don, uh, Dr. De Gracia. Thank you for joining me. Yeah, thank you for having me, Deepak. It's great to see you. Yeah, it's great to see you also, Don. So, uh, you know, um, a lot of people watching us right now um, may know you, a lot may not. Um, we reach about 15 million people over social media over the course of several weeks. So there are bound to be a lot of people who don't know who you are. Mm -hmm. And uh, therefore, it might be nice to just start by getting a little background on you, your life, your profession, where you are, what are you up to these days? Okay, great. Um, well, I am a professor in the physiology department at Wayne State University. I teach at the medical school and neuroscience. And that's kind of my day job. But I think the reason we're talking is way back at the dawn of the internet, I had uh, released a book on the internet called Do OBE that teaches people how to have out-of-body experiences and lucid dreams. And that was back in the early 90s, actually, before I even got my PhD. And I've been involved in studying altered states of consciousness and yoga and spirituality ever since. And so that's kind of my um, night job, I guess you could say. Your day job still is you're a professor teaching physiology at a medical school, right? Correct, yep. Yeah, that's good to know. So, uh, Don, you have this title, What is Science? I think all of us thought we knew what is science. But the other day I was interviewing uh, uh, someone who's a very eminent uh, cosmologist and a very eminent uh, theoretical physicist, experimental physicist as well. He said the same thing that you're implying, that nobody has a good definition of science. So let's start with just that. In your view, what is science? <clears throat> well, I mean, that is the place to start. If you look at the, the various definitions of science, I mean, it makes up an entire field of philosophy called the philosophy of science. And <clears throat> there was a fellow in the 1930s named Karl Popper who tried to define science as a method where we use experimentation to disprove our hypotheses. So it was the whole idea of falsifying information. <clears throat> and that was kind of an algorithmic approach, basically saying that science is a recipe or an algorithm that you can follow. And then in the 1960s, a very influential book was published by a man named Thomas Kuhn, who kind of flipped the whole story on its head and recognized that large parts of uh, what we call science are actually conditioned by our, our society and our social conditioning. And that there's these, that what we actually call science is kind of like the tip of the iceberg. And there's all these hidden cultural assumptions behind what we call science. And that kind of uh, took it out of the realm of thinking of it as a process or an algorithm and recognizing it as another cultural form. <clears throat> and then by the 1990s, a fellow came along named Feyerabend who did very detailed studies of the history of science from its genesis all the way up to the present. And what he concluded looking at from where? the discovery of, I'm sorry? Uh, excuse me, you said from where to the present time, this other person? 
the last person. Oh, Fire Abin, Fire Abin, Paul Fire Abin. And <clears throat> science, the history of science from when to when? Oh, from its origin, from the beginning. About five hundred. About the six sixteen hundreds and on up. Sure. Looking at various case studies. And what he's able to show through this historical analysis is that there is literally no pattern for science. You can't create a definition of it. It literally is created by, you know, hook or crook, whatever method works. Like he take, talks, for example, about how Versalius um, went against the laws of his society and of the Christian church to dig up dead bodies, to lay the foundation for anatomy by dissecting dead bodies <clears throat> and had Versalius, you know, stuck with the prescriptions of the society, he never would have done that, for example. Or Galileo, he, he does many, many examples, all of them very interesting. And Paul Feyerabend is a very entertaining and interesting author to read, and I recommend him. So yeah, so in the philosophy of science, basically right now, there's no consensus definition of what science is. And so that's kind of the starting point for what I discuss in what is science. In fact, that is chapter one and two explain what I just explained in a nutshell. And <clears throat> so my approach to it is involves uh, an understanding of what yoga accomplishes. Yeah, we'll go there. The viewpoint. I, I, I don't want to go there right now. OK, but, good. But let me ask you a couple of questions. Would you agree, though, that science is a good way of uh, modeling our perceptual and cognitive experiences giving them a theoretical construct, creating methodologies, observation, experiment, validation, falsification, predicting the results of experiments. And we know as a basis of this kind of investigation or look at reality or existence or perception, cognition, whatever, we are able to create technology, which is now helping us have this conversation and probably millions of people benefiting from it. We use science every day. I travel on jet planes and um, without science, our life as we know it today and technology is not possible. But I think where you and I are going is that despite all this predictive value of science and experiments, um, it is not really a method of exploring what we might call, as we currently understand science, it is not a method for what we might today call uh, fundamental existence or reality. It's a modeling of reality that helps us predict results of experiments and tells us what's next, what's going to happen next if we do this. Well, if you, to re, say what you just said in my own words yes because i agree with you completely is that what we call science today and what you the process you just described what that allows us to do is successfully describe the patterns that we experience in our sensory perceptions it is by far the best method to understand the patterns that we see in our sensory experience however the process is runs very quickly into limits and walls. And you know, again, I'm a neuroscientist, that's my training, that's what I teach, that's my background and my research area. <clears throat> and there's the whole field of consciousness studies and that methodology just simply breaks down when you start to ask about the relationship between the brain, which is a, a pattern of a object that we experience in our sensory perceptions what's the relationship between that and our mind and our consciousness? The whole thing collapses at that point. And there's no answer to those questions either. Okay. So, you know, in yoga, which we'll come to and all what you have to say about consciousness studies, I'll come to that soon. But just going by very fundamental understanding of the principles of yoga, both you and I are fans of yoga. I'm a very, um, uh, disciplined practitioner of yoga, all the eight limbs. And so in the understanding of yoga, we speak about modes of knowing, you know, and the modes of knowing are perception, mental activity, feeling, imagination, creativity, insight, imagination, 
and of course, you know, very deep understanding of the five human perceptions and human perceptual experiences. Also, a deep understanding of what we call the tanmatras, which are the subtle experiences of the senses: subtle sound, subtle this, subtle vision, subtle colors, taste, smells. And so, modes of knowing in yoga are basically what determine what is known. You know, so there's the knower, there's a mode of knowing, and there's something that is known, but it's the mode of knowing. Seeing determines the scenery. Hearing determines the sound and its interpretation. It also actual, actualizes as the, as the knower, the seer, or the one who's hearing. So all three are contained in any mode of knowing. But I was thinking, because of your background and my background too, I went to medical school, I'm an internist, neuroendocrinologist, I've studied physiology, but you know, I was thinking that's what we do in bi biology, we do the same thing. So anatomy is a mode of knowing, physiology is not a mode of knowing, biochemistry is another mode of knowing, and to these days biophysics is another mode of knowing, and then that leads to mathematics. All these are different modes of knowing in consciousness that allow us to experience biological systems in different ways. And so not one way is superior to the other. They're all basically different modes of knowing. So in a way, we as scientists are also practicing a form of yoga, not a complete yoga, but a form of yoga. And today's science, of course, is reductionist. And anything that's not reductionist, I'm told, is considered pseudoscience. I wasn't actually even aware of that until recently, that if you if it's not reductionist, then it's not considered science. So well that goes back, if I could interrupt for one second, that goes back to what we were talking about, the definition of science. See, since there is no definition of science, you cannot also define what is not science. So somebody that thinks that they know what pseudoscience is doesn't know what they're talking about. It's just that simple. I see. Say that last sentence again. Somebody who Somebody that thinks they know what pseudoscience is simply cannot know what it is because we have no definition of science in the first place. Wow, that's very good. I mean, I've never used that expression, but that's if there's no definition of science, there can't be any definition of pseudoscience. That's very good. Exactly. Yeah. So it's a very, very presumptuous attitude and uh, yeah. it reveals its own ignorance and its claim. And also science is an activity in consciousness, right? Yeah, mathematics is in consciousness and then experiments are designed in consciousness. Uh, theories are constructed in consciousness and observations what's are made. What's not in consciousness? What's not in consciousness? But then science, you know, yesterday I was interviewing somebody um, very eminent, you know, we had a three-way conversation the day before with the Nobel laureate in physics and, you know, these are very impressive people, very by their credentials, Nobel prizes, etc. And somebody asked me, "Do you have any empirical evidence for consciousness?" I said, "Consciousness is what creates the empirical evidence." But uh, so you know, you can't have an empirical definition of uh, that which creates. The, exper the empirical observation anyway. But it was clear to me that many of today's scientists are not even uh, educated in the various views or philosophies of science. You mentioned Karl Popper and all these people, and they quote these people though, but I have uh, an idea they have no history, no background in the history of uh, you know, the philosophies of science. Well, <clears throat> My experience has been particularly with people trained in physics is that they stop at Carl Parker. They're not aware of Kuhn. They're, and if you bring up Feyerob into them, they just dismiss him. They don't even take him seriously. But he is a legitimate part of this lineage and tradition of philosophy of science. And he's very good. He's very good. So then let's come to where we want to go with this, because, you know, where I want to go with our conversation is where you... Well, can I, can I give one comment to what you just said about uh, the scientists and their attitude towards consciousness? Yeah. 
you know, there's a very important idea in yoga, right? We're taught the idea of viveka or discrimination, right? And that's, and then the contrast to that is the idea of distraction, right? That your mind is distracted. And that distraction is ignorance. And see, there's a point where science itself, any form of knowledge can take the form of that ignorance and it prevents you from seeing broader truths. I would agree. So that's my response to people that are, you know, perhaps too highly educated in one very specialized dimension and don't have a, a wider appreciation of these things that we're talking about. So what you're saying is reductionism is the perpetuation of ignorance, because in order to study the one thing, you have to ignore everything else. Well, and it's an outdated idea too. I mean, you know, modern physics is based on modern dynamics that um, it's not reductionistic. It describes, you know, when you set up theoretical equations, it creates things called flow fields. And those flow fields are holistic solutions to the equation. It's the entire field that is the answer to the equation, right? The idea of reductionism was the old idea that, you know, goes back to the 1930s with subatomic particle accelerators that you could break things down into their more and more fundamental components. But that's a old idea that nobody even buys anymore, actually. It's not reductionism. I mean, even our understanding of quantum mechanics today is not reductionistic. It's very holistic, right? There's specific fields that define the quantum particles. So yeah. I, don't, I don't know if any practicing scientist today that would call that reductionism. Okay. Right? Well, they would just call it field theory. Good point. So let's, you know, I was particularly taken by your deeper examination of um, what I call the Siddhis. And, you know, I've practiced the Yoga Sutras of Patanjali for many years. I have uh, practiced the Vibhutis, uh, some very successfully, some not so successfully, but including the Flying Sutra and all that, Invisibility Sutra, all of those. And I, I can say that, you know, just like what you said, that having the initial experiences validates the mapping. And, uh, and once it validates the mapping, you know what's next. And once you get to what's next, you know what's next. So it's very confirming. And yet, uh, until I read your book, there was um, not that clarity from um, a scientific perspective. And it brought clarity to me uh, even more after I had uh, my discussion with these uh, physicists uh, recently. So I'm just going to, um, what uh, I'm going to do is paraphrase some of the sentences from this one and have you explain them if you don't mind and you know maybe no i don't mind at all these sentences are uh, um, maybe these sentences are not exactly from your book but they're <clears throat> my impressions of what i thought i was reading okay so right. you, you say we study not objects but how uh, how our minds interprets our sensory perceptions, which are, of course, a narrow bandwidth uh, when we come to human perception. That's less than 1% of the uh, visual bandwidth of experience, less than 1% of the acoustic bandwidth of experience, Absolutely. less than 1% of any experience possible. So please explain this. When we study objects, we do not study objects, but our minds and how we interpret our perceptions. Well, I mean, the idea goes back to Immanuel Kant. In fact, Kant identified that idea very clearly in his philosophy. And basically any object that I have, here's my mouse, right? This is a, a perception in my mind, right? That's how I know this is through my mind. If I assume that this object exists outside of my mind, it's literally impossible to know what this object is because it's only through the mind that we can know. This is basically the thing that Kant described. And so what that means is that to be perfectly logical, I can neither conform nor confirm nor deny that this thing exists outside of my mind. It literally is impossible. And so that's what's being alluded to there. 
So, so that's an important distinction because scientists naively believe that the objects they perceive are real and that they're studying something outside of their mind. And in fact, that's a state of delusion because everything that we are aware of exists only in our mind, which was Kant's whole point. So, yeah, no, I want to get into Kant in a moment, but you know, this reminds me right now of a phrase that I've heard recently quite a bit because I've been paying attention to it. And that is uh, naive realism. And according to naive realism, Absolutely. the world is real as perceived by the human senses. The world exists independently of our minds, but it is real as perceived by the human senses. So if there's no sensory perception, human perception, the world as you and I perceive it would still exist. And, you know, Einstein, by that definition, would be a naive realist because he said... Absolutely. Well, that's what I just said. All the scientists are. Say that again? If no one's looking that's at... That's what I just said. It doesn't exist. So you agree that Einstein and all these great scientists, in a way, were naive realists, except for maybe the few founders of the... Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics. Would you agree that? Yeah, I, I would say the only person I'm aware of in science that was not a uh, naive realist was Erwin Schrodinger. And I don't know if you're aware, but Erwin Schrodinger was a huge fan of Hinduism. He was yes, a Hindu fan. So he was a, a fan of the Upanishads, yes. Yeah, he knew, if you read his writings, he clearly knew about the things that you and I are discussing. What is life? Yeah. I don't think I don't think he had a naive view, but I think his contemporaries and everybody today, it's just the way that things are taught. Yeah, so I, I, I teach my students that term naive realism, in fact. So let's come to a little bit about Immanuel Kant, and then we go a little further, as you do in your book. And so, you know, you say something which is very clear here, which I'm going to find, but what you said here uh, very clearly was something that got me really thinking and took me to a new place of understanding. And that was when you said that when we perceive an object, any object, my hand, this iPhone, the statue behind me, you. Actually, what I perceive is by exclusion. That, that's a very interesting insight because when I'm looking at you, all I'm perceiving is the light that's reflected off you, right? So right. the rest of it is missing, right? When I touch yeah. somebody, all that's happening is electrons are bumping into electrons. I don't actually touch anything, right? No, it's repelling. Touch is a repulsive force. Uh, even it's the repelling I, of the electrons. Even when I walk on the ground, I'm actually floating, you know, to some extent, yeah. right? I'm levitating yeah. because I'm not in yeah. direct contact. So there is no direct contact from our senses to any object of experience, not to an strawberry, not to a rainbow, not to the Milky Way galaxy, right. not to uh, chocolate ice cream. There's no contact with the substance as such. There's only yeah. contact with what is excluded from the substance as such, right? Yeah. yeah. Okay. No, yeah. Nobody can argue against that. No. Okay. No. Then I mean, you know. Huh? No, go ahead, go ahead. So then we go one step further. So what is the thing in itself? And you said Kant could not answer. He said we could never know the thing in itself. But the yogi yeah. takes us a little step further because the yogi understands the thing in itself at all times. And I'm paraphrasing now from my own background. The thing in itself is always the infinite. Can't be anything else. Ultimately, yes. It can't be anything else. So you see, if I go into this or this, 
you go into the realm of the gunas, okay? You say right. it's the alchemy of gunas that creates this experience. Now the gunas are sattva, rajas, tamas, and there are many versions of that in Ayurveda, Vata, Pitta, Kapha, creation, sust sustenance, destruction, all that. You know, it's basically the gunas. Waves. The gunas are waves. Sorry? Waves. Yeah, waves. But the gunas are processes in a sense of the alchemy of seer, seeing, and scenery. They are the. Well, you want to hear it? Can we tangent on this topic for a second? Yes. I have an um, a interesting, you know, I've been strongly influenced by a fellow named I.K. Taimini, who was a theosophist that wrote most, mostly in the 1960s and 70s. And in fact, your view of consciousness, it, he factors prompt that I consider this book an extension of the work he started, Taimini. And Taimini defines the gunas in a way that maps them to our understanding of dynamics. Okay, so that tamas is the dynamics of what are called point attractors, which for example is Newton's laws, right? If I shoot a cannonball, it follows a trajectory, then it stops. It's inertia, it just stops. That's tamas, right? That's and what? then we have other mo tamas. Tamas. The good tamas. Yeah, tamas, tamas. Inertia, yes. <laughs> Yes, and then we have sattva, which is perfect rhythmic motion, right? That's periodic motion. That's what light waves are. They're sattva. They're perfect periodic motion. And then you have uh, rajas, and that was the most recently discovered in the West. We call that chaotic dynamics, right? So a chaotic system in terms of the way it's defined mathematically is rajas. So in a way, the West has rediscovered the gunas but we call it dynamics and it's the basis of our science. Okay. Right? That's... All physics comes from these concepts of dynamics. But these dynamical movements or processes are not physical entities, correct? They are modes of- No, they're patterns. They're patterns. Yeah, patterns of motion. Patterns of motion, okay. And that, that, that's why and these are cognized, of course, in consciousness, obviously, and they're processed in consciousness. And it's their alchemy that creates the experience of the physical world, right? So far, so good? I wouldn't even call it alchemy. I mean, it's just their, their nature. Yes, but the difference between this and this and that and that is the alchemy of the gunas, right? Or the different combinations, different proportions. You could call it chemistry, right? The chemistry of the gunas. Yeah, okay. So well, either so, term is fine. Either term is fine. I just, you know, because scientists would have a, a, yeah, yeah. a little allergic to the term the alchemy in general. I used the word alchemy, the reason I was to use the alchemy word right now is, um, but I like chemistry is more scientific, so that's fine. Um, yeah. But, the other day, I was interviewing a Nobel laureate in physics, Frank Wilczek, who discovered the particle anion. And, uh, you know, he's actually a very humble, thoughtful, uh, contemplative physicist, not understanding mm -hmm. he got the Nobel Prize, which makes it even more interesting that he's contemplative and very uh, deep thinker. But here's something I read in his book. So I questioned him about that. And uh, I was doing that in anticipation of, uh, of, uh, of my conversation with you. And so first of all, earlier on in this book, he says space, time and matter are identical. Then he says, you know, space time could be a form of matter. Uh, lots of very interesting statements, but then he comes to something called fundamentals, because that's what his book is about, fundamentals of reality. He has, uh, I think, uh, 10 principles of um, uh, fundamental reality. But he says that the modern fundamental ingredients of matter, the modern fundamental ingredients of matter, particles, are not solid bodies, have no intrinsic size or shape. They are structureless points where 
mass, spin, and charge reside. Mass, spin, and charge. So when I was speaking to him, I said, then you would agree that mass, spin, and charge are the fundamental ingredients of what we call, what humans call matter. He agreed. Okay. In fact, that's what he Maybe said. Maybe those are 10 mantras. Huh? 10 mantras. Uh, the mantras. I don't know if I'm, the 10 mantras, right? The basic elements of existence. Yeah. I, d I don't know if I'm pronouncing it correctly, but. The basic. map to that. 10 mantras. 10 mantras. Yes. 10 mantras, right. Yeah. 10 mantras. Maybe that's what. Maybe yeah. that's what we've discovered in our own way. But you know what I was thinking? I was thinking spin, charge, and mass. The spin guna. Spin is, is, the, is the movement, right? Is the sattva. Sattva. Charge is rajas and rajas and, and mass, mass is, tamas. is tamas. So Yeah, that's very insightful. That's a very good insight. Now, once you I get agree. there, once you get there, then dhyan, dharna, dharna, dhyan, samadhi gets you into the thing in itself, beyond, uh, beyond what uh, Khan said, okay? It gets you to the thing in itself. And then when you realize that these are the three movements of pure consciousness, and pure consciousness is totally without form, therefore must be infinite, because infinity is not humongous size. Infinity is just that which doesn't have form. And so it's neither big nor small, it's just infinite. And it is the infinite, which is go directly to the Rig Veda. It says, not Rig Veda, Bhagavad Gita, where Lord Krishna says, Prakritim swam vashtabhai vishrajami puna puna. Curving back within myself, I create again and again. I create infinite universes. And then further in the same chapter, Krishna says, uh, I am the field and I'm also the knower of the field. So the field is Kshetra, Kshetra, Kshetra and the knower of the field is Kshetragya. Now Einstein said in the new physics, there's no room for both matter and the field. The field is the only reality, but he stopped there. So when we go to these fields, we enter quantum fields and all this, you know, electromagnetic fields, but they're all a bubbling up of but the But they only make, field, right? Well, it's so funny because boom, it just falls right into place. Quantum mechanics only makes sense when there's an observer there to observe a value of the solution to the wave equation, right? Yes. So there you go. There's the field and the observer. They're intimately coupled. That too, we've discovered in the West. We just have not been able to appreciate it or assimilate it the same way that the Hindu teachings have let alone to work out the implications, which is what yoga is, right? Yoga is the application of these insights. And the West has not discovered that by a long shot yet. And I consider my work an attempt to try to push Western culture in the direction of appreciating what the, the vast discoveries that are ancient and thousands of years old from India. Yeah, and in my own practice, you know, I follow the sequence. so you know, the yamas, the niyamas, and then, you know, immediately after that, the asanas to prepare in the pranayam. And then very interesting, the pratyahara, where there's, there's breath suspension. And at that moment, if you introduce the dharna right there at the cusp of the manifest and the unmanifest, you have the experience that we call vibhuti or siddhi. And, you know, the more you refine your ability to step into that gap, which is pratyahara leading into the gap between sensation, image, feeling, thought, whatever, they're all entangled anyway. All, all sensations, perceptions, images, feelings, thought are in superposition till you have it. And then as soon as you have it, it's all one phenomenon. But with this practice, you can actually become the object, the object can become you, and then you know that you and both the object are the infinite being, which is what we there you go. Right? See, and that's the whole premise of my book. You just nailed it. Right? So then once see that, so that's samadhi, right? Knowing by being. 
yes. knowing by being, and you can then you fuse with the object. That that's completely outside the scope of Western understanding, but it's stated clearly in black and white in the Yoga Sutras. And it's a part of it's very practical. It's something that our mind is capable of doing. Just because in the Western cultures they never evolved the ability to do that, obviously doesn't mean it's not possible because there's this ancient tradition that teaches how to do it. And so that's so what I'm claiming and what inside once you understand the idea of what samadhi achieves, which is this fusion of the object and the knower, knowing by being, then you can understand my definition of science very easily. And what I'm claiming is that through thousands of years of this kind of trial error process of focusing on our sensory perceptions, we're mimicking that exact process, except it's extremely inefficient, extremely inefficient. It requires thousands of years, thousands of people. It's because of the, uh, the, it, the, the essence of it, the kind of energy function, if you want to think of it like that. When you're in samadhi, you have concentrated your mind down to a point, right? It's an extreme most concentration of the mind. That's another way you can think of samadhi. But right now in our normal waking state, our mind is very diffuse. Again, it's that distracted state that's described in you know elementary yoga. That's they teach you. You are naturally in the state of distraction where you're flitting about. Your mind is diffuse. It's not concentrated. So you sum the diffuse activity over thousands of years and the activity of thousands of people, and that equals to one instance of a person doing samadhi. Okay. So our knowledge, for example, of of gravity, that's the product of at least two three thousand years of this kind of diffuse trial and error that kind of just um, cuts away the chaff and eventually converges to the truth. Whereas a yogi who is in samadhi can instantly achieve the exact same insight. Just again, it's a power. Do you see what I'm saying about power function? Because of the concentration, you have so much power that you, you, know, you can fuse with that concept of, of, of weight or movement. Right, if that's your object of meditation, is just what is weight. In a way, that's Instantly. the power of the atom, right? The power, objectively speaking, the more concentration you have of mass and density energy, the more. Well, power. and I actually have that picture in the book where I compare them, right? I show an atomic explosion at, that's compared to yoga versus like a firecracker, which is compared to our normal mind. So I am looking forward to reading your book, The Yogic View of Consciousness. I shall get it. And once I finish reading it, maybe we can have another conversation. I would love to do that. That would be great. Because there's nothing more important than finding out truth or getting closer to the truth of who we are instead of what's out there. And once you discover who you are, then you see what's out there is your own creation. And that who you are is a timeless being that is not subject to birth and death. And that is the greatest gift of yoga, the freedom from these constructs. Well, you know, one of the things that's affected me too, as I've continued down this path of learning these ideas and refining them is um, it causes a shift in your thinking, right? It's, that's a fundamental aspect. It's a difference in perspective. And you have these new um, ideas that you can use so, you know, you were talking earlier about consciousness being infinite, right? And to a typical person, it's like a typical scientist, that would sound like googly gook, right? They would think you're just crazy for saying something like that. But here, consider this now. This is an insight I recently had that ties back to that very idea. So have you ever considered that we're always in the present? Every time you check, it's the present, right? Right now is the present. There's only always the present. Have you like thought about that? I mean, you know that experience. No, right? no, I always not only think about that, but I also have ultimately come to the conclusion that what we call the present is not a moment in time. It is the present no, it's not. Which time is born. And what we it call is the eternal, it hmm? is the eternal, it's, it's, we're in eternity at this moment. There's only one moment called the present. Right, but, but, but now, let me ask you a We're question. Eternity. Let me ask you a question on that, okay? Since sure. now the present is unique, 
never happened before in the history of the universe. And my present is a little different right now than your present or the present of somebody else in Zimbabwe. And each present is unique and never happened in the history of the universe. And yet it's the same present, right? The present has no memory. Therefore, the past never occurred. And therefore, there is no such thing as a future either. They are all constructs in the same way as space, time, energy, information, and matter. Consciousness conceiving, the... governing, constructing, and <clears throat> becoming this theater of space, time, and, and causalities all are construction. <laughs> That is really interesting you'd say that because that's exactly along the lines. Now, my insights are a, like a variation of yours. But so here's the first thing. So think about mental activity, right? When we think it's a sequential process, right? So you can imagine it moving, it's linear, right? It moves in one dimension along a line. But the very nature of consciousness that it's always exists, it doesn't extend in time and it doesn't exist in space. We literally experience the zero dimensional nature of our consciousness continuously. It's our, the only thing that exists is our constant experience of the zero dimensional nature of our consciousness. Now, if that isn't a direct experience of what you're calling infinity of consciousness, I don't know what is. And it's so simple. It's so obvious to recognize. Once it's pointed out, do you see what I'm saying? This is the way yoga has affected my thinking. No, to it's... understand what it means to always be in the present. Now, to go how you elaborated. So the question is, where does time come from? <clears throat> and I would say it slightly differently. So memory is a part of the existence, right? It is a thing in existence, memory is. And it's the reason that things appear to change is because if this, you know, instead of thinking of it as moments of time, it just keeps re repeating round and round, right? So at this now re repetition, I'm comparing it in my mind to the previous one and the differences there's differences and that's what creates time so it's this comparison in memory in the mind is what is creating time it's a vritti if there was it's if, a vritti like everything else it's a vritti yeah. right yeah well you got one vritti of the previous instant with the vritti of right now and you're comparing them and if there's a difference a delta then we think that think of that as time See, so time is purely mentally constructed. It's not a physical thing at all. It's a so, consequence of the way the mind functions. All there is then is chit and vritti, chit and vritti, chit and vritti. A hundred percent. Vritti gives rise to form and phenomena, and chit is the formless, and they go back and forth. And we experience it constantly, right? I mean, you know, another idea related to this that has been... Um, becoming more and more obvious to me, the meaning of it is the idea of the screen of consciousness. Yes, so tell me. Right, all of this is the screen of my consciousness. So there's only two things, actually. There's only two things. There's what is the screen, and then there's the thing that is that knows the screen, right? The knower and basically the purusha and the prakriti, if you want to use the samkhya terms. That's all there is, and it's constantly the state. There's only these two things that ever exist, always. This has been wonderful, very fascinating. You have a, a bird there. Is that a falcon? Or what is that in the background? Oh, um, that, that. Oh, the picture? Yeah. What is that? Oh, that's a, that's a tiger. It's a Chinese tiger. I got that in Taiwan many years oh, ago. Oh, a Chinese a tiger. Yes, 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 yes. Beautiful. No, that, no, thank you. For okay, that. sir. Well, until next time, I'm going to read the yogic view of consciousness, but let's call today's talk, just give it the title, What is Science? And then underneath that, let's put the yogic view of consciousness also as the subtitle. And then next time, we'll just focus on the on your new book, if that's okay. Absolutely. This is well, this was tons of fun. Thank you so much. For I enjoyed it. Thank, you. Thank you. Very good that you confirm mass charge and and spin as the gunas. I love now that. you've given me a new one to think about and to throw into my thinking. That's very insightful, Deepak. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Carolyn, Carolyn. Hi, Deepak. Yeah, I think we're all set. You heard the title and all? Yes, I did. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, Don. Thanks. Well, so, okay, thank, thank you, you Deepak. Thank yeah. you, Carolyn.